you are an entrepreneur, a professional, a speaker, or a coach, and although you've come a long way, it's time for you to take it to the next level. We've got you. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. We'll help you use authority and influencer marketing to build your business stronger and faster by publishing a book. You'll hear from guests that are thought leaders in sales, marketing, networking, communication, social media, promotion, and business leadership. Let's do it. This is the Author to Authority Podcast. And now your host, the extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder. Welcome to the Author to Authority Podcast. I'm your host, Kim Thompson Pinder. And I'm so excited to announce that in August, we will be having the 400th episode of the Author to Authority Podcast. And in celebration of that, I have decided to do the top 25 episodes of the Author to Authority podcast for the whole summer. And we will celebrate the 400 about mid-August, so there'll be a couple of episodes after that. And I chose these episodes because they were the ones that I just personally felt were the ones that gave tremendous amount of value that were going to help you as an entrepreneur, professional, a speaker, a coach to move your business forward. These were value-packed episodes that are just going to give you action steps that are just going to really propel you to the next level. So I'd love for you to sit back, relax, and enjoy this top 25 episode. Welcome to the Author to Authority podcast. And today I have Tracy Hazard with us. And when I go to do record a podcast, sometimes I can't remember because sometimes I've booked people like a couple of months back or a month or so back. So I've got to go back and I've got to review, you know, what was it that made me want to interview this person? And when I went back and was just looking at Tracy's bio, I realized why we wanted her on the podcast today and talking about becoming bingeable. Now, Tracy is a seasoned media expert. So that's got to, I want you to just kind of hear that. She's a seasoned media expert. So she's going to be bringing us good stuff today. She has done over 2,600 interviews. She has articles in Authority Magazine, BuzzFeed. She has been seen everywhere. She has multiple top-ranked video podcasts, cast and video podcasts like The Binge Factor and Feed Your Brand. And she is one of CIO's top 26 entrepreneur podcasts. So I think she has a really good idea of what's going on and how to really get herself out there. Now, she is the CEO and co-founder of Poditize, and Tracy brings diverse views from what works and what doesn't work in marketing and media. So, Tracy, I'm just so excited to have you on the show today. Thank you. I'm excited to talk about something which I think is so critical, author authority. I'm so glad that's in the title of your show, and it is your mission. (laughs) And that's why I agreed to come on the show, because I like that message. It's so critically important. Oh, thank you, Tracy. And I agree. Most people don't realize the power of authority marketing. And so not only do we teach authority marketing, but you know, when you have author in authority, and you combine a book with that authority marketing, it's not a field of dreams, but your book becomes such a valuable tool to build your business. So I am so looking forward to the conversation. And we're going to be talking about becoming bingeable and attract more leads and sell even more stuff. But before we get into today's topic, Tracy, I would love for you to just to take a little bit of time, introduce yourself and sort of share your business origin story. Like how did you come to do all these things? Well, I have to say that I always wanted to be a writer. That Mm -hmm. was my kind of 
I thought that's what I wanted to do. I had a typewriter in my closet and would pretend to be a journalist when I was young, right? Like it was the thing that I always wanted, but I decided to go to art school and my father was horrified by that, right? Lucky for me, I did go to art school and I discovered this whole world of design and product and graphics and like this whole area of things that I probably would never have understood the power what you create and the creative process if that had not happened for me. And it mm-hmm. ended up making me a better writer in the long run. So Long's path through selling products and doing all kinds of things in my early parts of my career in the first 20 years. And we came to a crossroads in our business and we had a product design business where we were designing products for Target, Walmart, Costco, those kinds of things for major brands like Martha Stewart Living, Better Homes and Gardens, names you know every single day, we were ghost designers. And the problem was, is that it was getting to be more of an influencer world. And we were the best in it. Like we designed hundreds of products that did billions of dollars, but no one knew who we were. So we thought about this and we said, what's the future for our business? How are we going to make sure that we're in demand? But our company, the companies we work for, their brand names matter more to them than our name. So how are we going to do that? How are we going to build this niche authority so that people Mm want to hire us and it is easy for us to get work? And at that time, 3D printing was coming into the marketplace on a consumer side. And we'd already been Mm -hmm. using it for years in an industrial sense. And so we said, well, we could be an expert in this and we could bring our information out there. And by that, exposing our design skills and and exposing what we could bring to the world. And so we thought about that. We said, "Okay, let's do this. And we decided on podcasting as our media type to go into it rather than blogs, because I had been blogging and I couldn't get anyone to read my blog but my dad. And so I said, this isn't working for us. Like, what else are we going to do? So we said, "Okay, well, let's try this podcasting thing. It seems pretty cool. And this was about 2000. 2014. And so we started. Ooh, so you were an earlier adopter. I, yeah, as if we have since I've been called an OG in podcasting, but I've met people who were a decade before that when it was really, it was called podcasting, but it wasn't really even syndicated like it is today. So yeah. it was really old. You only had it within your own website. And so, yeah, so we're really early on in that sort of stage of doing it. What we found was so incredibly cool. We started this geeky little podcast called WTFFF. FFF is fused filament fabrication, which is a geeky term for 3D printing. And it drew just the right audience. In five months, we had 100,000 listeners a month. We were featured in Forbes. I got offered a column to write on innovation, specifically disruptive innovation of all kinds for Inc. Magazine, which I wrote for four years, 400 articles. So like it all came out of the podcast. And we had gone into this whole sense of it thinking, well, at best, we'll get a few people to know who we are. We'll at least be able to send prospective clients to some visual, some audio that they could they could check yeah. out. And it turned into so much more authority. So I was speaking on stages all over, talking about innovation in 3D printing, talking about product design. Clients were flowing in. In fact, lots of clients we didn't even want to take. Like we weren't even the right fit for them because of the way our services were cost and how they worked. And we ended up having to develop some additional services that were at a different price point. And so it was just really amazing how just that shift in authority Mm -hmm. And visibility of that authority worked for us. And that's what people were flocking to. And so before you know it, people were saying, I have a podcast and I'm not getting what you have out of it. Or I have a YouTube channel and I'm not getting what you're getting. What are you doing? Mm -hmm. And then I would start to tell them. And then they would hand me their credit card and they would say, can you do this for me? And that's why I have a completely different business today. Because they were like, that's just too much work. Will you just do this? Like that's how it happened. And, but so I'm going to say this to you is that authority is a fast, fast path. Is it no work? (laughs) That is never true, right? It cannot be true because in order to establish your authority, it has to be yours. You have to be a part of it and a participant in it. So you can have somebody who does like the technical stuff for you, posts it up on YouTube, posts it in the places you need it for, does SEO, does some of those search engine optimization things that are so critical. But at the end of the day, I cannot make you record it. I cannot make you talk about what you're an authority in. Must create that content. It's essential. 
And that's the part I wish I could get across more to people. Like you have to do that. It's, it is you that you're putting out there. That's what's the difference maker. You know, loved what you said. There was a couple of things in there. So first of all, when you started up your podcast, you're, you niched right down. I did. And, you know, back then it was easier to build because there wasn't as many. Yeah, I, I but, cannot promise anyone what we the results we got in five no. months. I can't do it today. It just doesn't work the same way. No. But what I was thinking about was the fact that, you know, instead of trying to go broad, you went deep. Yes. And that's a mistake too many people make. They they go too broad in their audience reach. They go too broad in their topic. When you are deep and narrow. It has yeah. such great power. And you'd be surprised. Mm. I mean, we were deep and narrow in 3D printing, but people would come to us for all kinds of projects and jobs. And, you know, that had nothing to do with 3D printing at the end of the day, but that's how they found us. Yeah. And so I got some great jobs doing color palettes, like color palettes, like, which is an expertise <laughs> of mine. I used to do color palettes for Martha Stewart and things like that. So doing color palettes is my Great expertise. And I, I did a whole episode on on how to get better colors and things when you were working with the 3D printers. And that was, you know, or I also did an episode about how much I hated the colors of the filament of the 3D printers. And here's why. And I got filament companies coming to me saying, hey, we, could we hire you to do forecast line for us, the color line? So you could be so surprised by what it will lead to when something makes a connection to someone. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, your story is kind of like mine. Like I fell into becoming a publisher. <laughs> yeah, because people I, were I, like shoving credit cards at you. So I saw you nod there. <laughs> just just about, I started ghostwriting to help pay for my son's wedding. I had no intention of becoming a publisher. I had already written and published some books, but I needed money. You know, weddings are expensive and we were driving two cars by faith. So I don't know if you've ever driven a car by faith anymore, but. We had decided that we were no longer going into debt for vehicles. So we weren't going to be buying new vehicles. And both of our, my husband's and mine's vehicle were at the point where they were barely drivable, but we didn't have the money to replace them. And the mechanic said, you know, just stop putting money into this thing because you've got to save up for a new vehicle. So you get in the car, and you'd pray you make it to where you're going to go. <laughs> I have had a car like that. <laughs> <laughs> that car and you pray that you make it back home and for us that was a half an hour drive i put a new engine in a car like that once and the service member was like mm -mm, i don't think you should i really don't think you should spend five thousand dollar on a new engine like she shouldn't do it and i was like i'm gonna do it <laughs> <laughs> did you regret it later no actually i didn't i ended up getting four more years and got my daughter through college so like it was nice. worth it. i got i got it just to the point i needed it before it died <laughs> so was one of those things where I fell into it. But once I was into it, I just realized that, you know, it was such a, I didn't even know it was going to be a passion of mine, but it has truly become such a passion to see, to see people get their messages out in writing. Yes. You know, messages that change, not the whole world, but they change a small part of it in a significant way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a huge reader. So that's not in my bio, but I read about 300 books a year. Um, yeah, in all kinds of categories. So, and I, I'm known for it, even if a book's bad, finishing it. And <laughs> because I want to, I want to understand why, like, why did you publish this? Why is this happening? Book's bad. I will read it too, just to understand yeah. better and have this knowledge base of what's going on. So I'm a gigantic reader. So the fact that I still don't have a book out is a shocker. But I got distracted by the podcasting world. So, <laughs> and there's so much. It's so the problem for me has been in not getting published. I have all the drafts behind my desk. I always joke, like, it's like back here because it is actually literally right back there in a pile. <laughs> there are three of them. And the problem is, is that my content is moving farther ahead of it. That every time I go to edit it, it's like, oh, but I don't have this. Oh, but I don't have that. And it never makes it out. That's what's happening. What happens in my world. So, so I, but I, got, I do need I got, to do it. I know I do because it's the next level authority, right? So yes. yeah, it is. You know, you just you can't be imbalanced. You need to be in all the places mm -hmm. where and the type of media that those people want to consume. So it's not always a one clear match. Not everybody is no. a video watcher. I hate watching videos. I prefer audio and I prefer the written word. 
And I will do those by default first. In fact, the other day I shared a video with my husband and he was like, is this really a video? And he was like, are you really sharing me a video? And I was like, yes, because he loves video, but I avoid them like the plague. I never even turn the sound on on a video on my phone ever. And that's just a just a difference in it. But I record video all the time for people. I'm comfortable on video. I just don't prefer it as my method of consumption because it doesn't land in my learning process. Everybody has their own method and you really need to be video, audio, and written word. Word. All three of those things matter. And if you're starting in that written word part, those other two things are ways to reach the right audience because when they're ready to deep dive into something and learning just because they're passive consumption is video doesn't mean that they won't read a book some well <laughs> and there are a lot out there that will and i mean i know okay not every single person that listens to podcasts but in my specific category the people who listen to podcasts are also big readers because yes it makes sense if you're going to be talking about authors right you should be a good reader You should be a big reader. But I loved what you said about having all three, because to be honest, my preferred is right in writing. I do watch videos and I do listen to podcasts, but hand me a well-written book that tells me what I need to know. And I can read that a whole lot faster than I can watch a video because I I find in a lot of videos and even in podcasts, there's just way too much preamble for me. Like I want to get to the main point. Get to the point. Yeah. (laughs) Get to the point with books. You can't. Okay. A well-written book does not preamble. Right. Right. And then some people need the chat though. See some people in order to make connection to what's being said. Mm -hmm. And that's why, that's why you need all the different modes. And this is why as an author of any book, you should be doing both. I'm going to call it soundbite media you know, where mm-hmm. you're going in and you're doing 30 seconds, 60 seconds, you do yeah. three minutes on a, on a news channel. Those things happen when you're promoting a book, but they're not enough. Sound bites yeah. are not enough. Doing podcast interviews are fantastic because it gives you the time to tell the backstory. It gives you tell them yeah. the things that make it in the book. However, if you don't do that, then you're going to fail selling any books from any podcast interviews. You cannot do the thing, which I have heard many authors do, which is, oh, you have to buy my book to get that. If you say that in any podcast, no one will ever buy your book. No. Because that's not what podcasting and podcast listeners expect. You know, we're quickly running out of time and I want you to get to the main (laughs) point, but (laughs) I know we're rambling, but I think this is just really important when, when you want to position yourself as the authority, you give the information away. You don't give your products and your services away. But if you want to be seen as that true authority, you give the information away and you don't hold it back. And you, you don't make people, in a sense, have to beg you or pay you for the information. I mean, you're never going to do something in the linear way you might lay it out in your book. So if you've got a how to book, you know, how to content market, whatever that is, it's going to be linear path within that book. Yes, It's not going to happen like that on a podcast. It's not going to happen like that in an interview. It shouldn't happen like that when you're putting out whatever content or articles or Mm -hmm. other things that you're writing and doing surrounding this, creating that authority for it. But Mm -hmm. in order to be a true expert, you have to share and sharing shows your audience that you care enough about them for them to be successful yeah. without buying your book. And they're more likely to buy it because of that. And well, that's really what we want to, you know, happen yeah. more on podcasts and happen more in that author interview process. Cause it's missing a lot of times in the media prep that happens. It makes you attractive. See, this is what people don't get. People think if I give all the information away, why would they work with me? See, when you give all the information away and you do it in the right way, your body language says, I don't care if you work with me. I am not desperate for your money, but it creates the sense that I want to work with you. And that's the difference. And that's what makes you attractive is, you know, when you give this information away and you do it with kindness and you do it with sincerity Oh, that's attractive. It is. It really is. And the other part of that that I really want you all to hear what Kim is saying is that 
it's not just about giving the information away because you're not giving it all away, right? No. You're you're hitting on the thing that's impactful to them because and they yeah. want to know more and they believe that you're the true guide for them. And when mm-hmm. they believe that, there it's a one it's a one call close. That's what I say. We have so yeah. often someone who's listened to or binged on our show will come and do business with us and buy ten thousand dollars worth of product and services from us because they heard enough on that. They had maybe a couple of questions and then they close within the call. And that's yeah. amazing. That's huge power. And it's one of the return on investments that most people don't understand they'll get from their podcast. That is in a okay. different way than you would get from a written sales letter or an email chain. They're, they're always hesitant. And it's why you have a funnel when you go the other way on it. It's mm. because when you're hearing my voice, you're hearing my sincerity, you're also... I give you a tip and you use it and it works. All of a yeah. sudden, you I've sold you without selling you. And you sold yeah. yourself into removing any objections that you may have had to saying, I think she's my answer for success. And now you come to me ready to go. That is a gigantic leap for a lot of businesses to make to sell a high-end product. And that's what we do all the time. I mean, it's, it's just astounding to me how fast, we, how many one to two call closes we have maximum. And usually there are two calls because they're like, I got to go talk to my partner and get the money. <laughs> you know, like it's, that's it. Yeah. I'm ready to go, but I got to go talk to them and fix this out or, or, you know, something like or that. Or I got to talk to myself. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That happens on occasion too. But yeah, it's like, I'm ready to, yeah, send me the invoice and within a week I'm ready to go, but we'll have one more phone call to do that, you know, and so you can tell them what you told me. That's what it is. And that's so powerful. Imagine if your book could do that. And one of my favorite things is I heard Malcolm Gladwell early on, I think it was like 2016 or something like that. So it was pretty early on. He had a podcast and someone asked him, why didn't you just write another book? Why just start a podcast? And he said, because you think with your eyes, but you feel with your ears. And when we feel, we make these connections to people, to their products, to their services. We believe more than what we see when we we watch it on a video or we read it. It's a little bit different. So making sure all those pieces are together for you is going to make the difference into selling your book and perhaps selling the business that's underneath that book. Yeah. You know, I, there's so much that relates between a podcast and a book and what happens when you combine the two of them together. Because- a well-written book does some of the same things as a podcast. If you write your book the right way, it creates relationship with the reader. So they, they're they visually seeing it, they're picturing it, they're hearing your expertise. And then you combine that with the podcast where they're they're seeing you in real life and they're hearing your voice and then they're reading your book. It's a, it's a powerful combination It is in terms of building your business because each one does a slightly different thing, but they work so well together to create this effect of, I've got to work with that person. So the thing that I hear the most from authors is, I wish I started my podcast sooner. I believe I would have sold more books. Or it's the flip of that is that they didn't do it until after their book was out there and not doing well and, but really helped sell the next book or create the next book because it gave them the idea or the angle or the, the information where they started to like, almost like test market it and Mm -hmm. then be able to build that again. So when we put them together soon enough in the process, I find that we sell more books, we build more fans, we build a better platform overall. And more importantly, if you do it right, and that's the part that I say where we we take everything from video to audio to blog to social share and your book sales, right? Like we put all those pieces together on one home base, not leaving it out there at Amazon, not leaving it out there in YouTube, not leaving it out there in TikTok, making sure it's all in your home base is going to build your authority in a much better way. And that is the most underutilized methodology Mm -hmm. for making sure that you stay in authority in your niche. Wow. Okay. Audience, I've been saying this a lot lately, but what she just said is the golden nugget of this podcast. Those words, when you think about it, see, it's not about just having all this stuff. It's about having them all work together to bring them to your home base. And that's, 
you know, that's something I'm working on right now. See, I've got all these things, right? But I'm working on where's home base. And so that's the next step for me. You just so, said, so if I can just say, give you a little yes. piece of advice, Kim, is that there are two ways to approach it. One, mm-hmm. you can have a home base that is in the niche. So like we have a home base for 3D printing. It's called 3dstartpoint.com. Mm-hmm. And we have 650 episodes that we did on that show that I mentioned earlier. I don't keep doing it, but that base gets traffic every single week because the yeah. podcast gets listeners every single week, even though we aren't producing new shows. It's mm-hmm. such a volume and a resource. So you can have a, your area be it, be a home base or it can be you. And it does depend on what kind of author you are. And if you have too many, I'm going to say disparate kind of audiences. And there are lots of authors that are like that, where they write in in mystery and romance and like they write in different areas, then yeah. it needs to be you as the common base, because otherwise yeah. you end up, your niches won't work, right? So yeah. be thinking seriously about what makes sense, but try to keep it to one base for everything if possible. It's yeah. going to be easier to manage and much more powerful for you. Well, most of the people listening to this show are consultants, professionals, speakers, coaches. So you know, they're not necessarily writing fiction books. They, they're they writing nonfiction books to build their business. So and then your so- business is the home base. Keep that in yeah. mind. No separate book sites. There's lots of companies that advise you on that. Put that right on your consulting site. Put it right yeah. with your home bases need to be combined. In fact, put the content front and center, not your mm-hmm. book, but the free stuff front and center. Make sure it's on the homepage. Make sure your sales message is not the first thing people see. Good point. Good point. You know, we actually never, we kind of skirted all around this becoming bingeable. We've got about five to seven minutes left. So was there anything, some specific things that you had thought of for today for the show? Because I know we talked about a lot of stuff, but I just want to make sure I give you that chance to share what you had sure. prepared. Yeah, no, you know, look, I, I'm always happy to go ad hoc and go whichever direction every, the audience and the host wants me to go. Why? Because it's going to be more valuable to all of you because I can mm-hmm. talk about anything. So <laughs> I do this all the time. But the reality is, is at the end of the day, when someone binges on your stuff, that's when they buy everything. That's when they shove their credit cards at you. That's when they are, they're there for you and for what you have. They, they believe in you. There is no way someone listens to you for 20 episodes, 50 episodes, 100 episodes. There's no way they do that and they don't want more from you. That it's just yeah. not possible. And what happens there also is that they become your best raving fans. That's how mm. your audience grows. They say, oh, I heard on this podcast, you, they might not even remember my name or the name of my show, but it doesn't matter. They said, I heard on this 3D print podcast, this thing, and it was a great tip and I tried it and it worked. You should go find that podcast. They will. Like, somebody will go out and they'll do it, right? And that's the power of what you're creating there is this opportunity for someone to quote you. Now, and when it happens, and it will happen occasionally, someone happened to me and they quoted me back to me again. And I was like, they were like, I heard somebody in the industry say this. And I was like, that might have been me because it's such, it's such a common phrase for me that I would be like, I think that's me. That's the most, that's when you know you've made it. That's mm-hmm. when you know you're really an authority in your niche. <laughs> wow. Wow. That is cool. That is so cool. Let's talk I remember about- the first time, just to tell this quick story, when I remember the sure. first time somebody, I, I realized that binge listening happened mm. and somebody sent me a message and said, and we had at that point, like 200 episodes or something like that. And they reached out to us and sent us a, a message and I'm sure there'd been other messages. And I thought we had loyal fans that were listening every week, but I didn't ever realize somebody might find us and go back to the beginning and listen to everything that's a true binger, like, like binge watch a Netflix show. Right. And so they've said, reached out and said, I've only, I'm only at about 98 episodes, but you say something here and I'm really hoping I'm going to get to it in the next episodes that are coming. But if I don't, can you record one before I get there? And they asked their question so we could answer it for them. And I was like, so I reached back out and I said, oh, it's 103. We did answer that. And it's number 103 and it's on, you know, so you're almost there. And uh, but I just thought that was like, And I looked at my partner and I said, they listen to a hundred episodes in a week. That is crazy. Can I, I don't know if I could listen to me for a hundred episodes. And, and I was like, we are onto something, right? 
Yeah. We're on to something. We change somebody's perspective. There's no way they can consume that much content and not change the way they think about something. That's wow. when you have real impact. Wow. Okay. We are just about at the end of the show here. So Tracy, what would be the one thing that you would say to kind of sum up everything we've covered today? The one, <laughs> one thing that you really want them to take away, the audience to take away with them. I think when you're an author, this term platform gets thrown around a lot. It's something that if you want to go to a high level publisher, they're going to say, what's your platform before they even consider your book type, right? Mm -hmm. They aren't even going to talk about that until they know. And what they're saying there is how many people do you have control over access to mm -hmm. that could buy your book from the beginning? That's really what they're mm -hmm. asking you. And so in an entrepreneur world, we would call this the friends and family round in a capital race, right? Who do you have access to that's going to be the immediate purchasers, the immediate interest, the mm -hmm. ones who are going to share it and rave about it for you, who you have enough influence over? And when that's not large enough, it's slow going for, for yeah. books. Yeah. It's a slow burn. So the sooner you have that built and control under your control, the better it is. Too often, though, we put it in somebody else's hands. We say, mm -hmm. oh, well, I have 10,000 Instagram followers, but they're Instagrams. They're not yours. You think yeah. they're yours, but at the end of the day, Instagram controls the algorithm on who you can reach out there. And if they decide your message is too salesy or you're hawking your book too hard in your video, it's not circulating to 100% of your followers. So the yeah. only way for you to reach them is to have control over them and make sure that you're bringing them back to that home base, to that place where you actually have reached them. And I don't want you to miss this point. Podcasting mm -hmm. is a platform builder, but only if you get them off the podcast app. Spotify, Apple, Amen. they do not give us our subscribers. We do not know who they are. So our job is to charm you all here and get you to follow us elsewhere, get you to come back mm -hmm. to our websites, get you to do that. So the only way to do that is to deliver you value. And it's not to deliver you some call to action that sends you to a download. That's not enough in today's world. It is for you to say, Tracy, thank you so much for what you get, gave to me here. I'm sure you have so much more valuable information, and I'm going to go to the fastest place where I can get the most of it, and that's your website. Now you are a part of my platform. Now you're going to follow me on whatever it is that you want to, which is great. Follow me on LinkedIn. Follow me on Twitter. I'm, I'm everywhere. It's like it's not, not hard to find me in any of those places. So go, you go do that so that I'm available to you where it's convenient for you. But yes. you also know that if you need to deep dive into my resources, they're there for you too. And they are there on our website. So like, that's just, that's the powerful message you need to leave every time you do an interview, every time you're out there talking about your book, every time you're there talking about your niche, your area, your mm -hmm. authority, your authority building is in sharing your resources, your library, mm -hmm. yourself. Yeah. You know, what you said is powerful there. People say to me, oh, I get my book up on Amazon. And yes, you need to have your book up on Amazon because that's where you're published. Right. But Amazon does not tell you who buys that book. No, they don't. And neither does Spotify and Apple. Like none of those places give you the exact person. We think that happens on social media, but it's also not true because yeah. at the end of the day, you can't always get all their email addresses. You can't always get access to all of them. So unless they are in your ecosystem, you don't own them. Wow. Oh, we can't go there today. <laughs> we'll have to do another one. You're going to come on my show, right? <laughs> so uh, Most we'll, definitely. We'll do that. You see, that is what she just said is another whole topic that we don't have time for today. But that it's important to know that you have to own your audience. Let's and they, do this. You know, I will have you on my show. We'll talk about podcast swapping and the power of that for, for authors. And we'll create a segment of it that you can reshare to your audience in your feed. Yay! Love it. And then you don't have to do any <laughs> extra content. <laughs> I'll give it to you. How about that? Why? Because it. it's not important to me to own all of that, right? It's important yeah. for us to collaborate. And that's yes. going to be more powerful for both of us. Amazing. So Tracy, if people have been listening to this today and they're like, okay, I just got to connect with Tracy. Like this has just blown my mind. What is the best way for people to connect with you? 
So the best way is if you want to just start chatting with me, following me, doing things, go to LinkedIn because it is the one place that I spend my time on. I have a big team who handles social media, but that's the one place where I actively am myself every day. So that's it. That's it. If you want to do on that personal connection, Podetize, my company website has all our resources, all connections to the binge factor, feed your brand. Our, we have a giant resource library that's about to be relaunched into our system. So if you want to ask any question about how do you do this podcast or how do I create that? There's an answer there. And that's also the place. I mean, if you are thinking about starting a podcast, have a conversation with us because yeah. we want to, it's not right for everyone, but if it's right for you, what is that method that's going to be the easiest for you to keep doing what you're really great at and let us do a lot of the other heavy lifting? That is so awesome, Tracy. Wow, this conversation has just thrilled me to the bones today. <laughs> I'm so excited. I was looking forward to our call all week too. So <laughs> there, One thing I've noticed lately on the podcast and been work, going through Podmatch is the level of of experts that I that I've been interviewing from Podmatch has been amazing. So, you know, Podmatch is an incredible tool. If you want a guest on podcasts or if you're a podcast host wanting to find podcasts, you need to check out Podmatch because the quality of my show has elevated greatly since using it. And so I am just I hear so that thankful. from everyone I talk to. And Alex Sanfilippo and I are good friends and we're collaborators and we're working on some new, new, exciting things together as well, because we just I love his product. I think Podmatch is yeah. incredible. Here's yeah. what I found. It's because you're committed to your business. So you're willing to spend some money and spend some time in Podmatch. And it's not a lot of money. It's no. lo low entry for what it does. And because you're that kind of active person with your mm -hmm. show, makes it easier for me to be a guest on your show and get more out of it. And then when you come on my show, you realize the same thing. It goes both ways. Only yeah. those that are truly active and interested in promoting and doing all the right things to get their message out there will take the time to use a tool like Podmatch. And that's simply that it's an action taker environment. Yeah. And that's rare. It is rare. I got to meet Alex. Okay, so this episode will go out in May. I met Alex in January. Oh, good. <laughs> so it was incredible. You yeah. know what? Unfortunately, we have to end. You and I could keep going on for a long time. So this has been Tracy Hazard and Kim Thompson Pinder on the Author to Authority podcast. Thank you so much for listening. And we'll see you on the very next episode. Bye now. You've been listening to the Author to Authority podcast. The extraordinary word ninja, Kim Thompson Pinder, has helped over 200 entrepreneurs, professionals, speakers, and coaches write and publish their books that have become incredible marketing tools for their business. And many of those have gone on to become Amazon best-selling authors and have used their books to land high-level clients and get on big stages. We hope you've enjoyed the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review. And we'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit the website at www.author2authoritypodcast.com. See you next time.